the streets of Danbury, not just talking about it. All right. So storming the uh, the embassy, the thrust is, I want to change the world, I want to change yeah. the world. You go to seminary, you marry the, the president of the seminary, you're out, you're starting your ministry. Talk a little bit about world relief. How did you take this from Britain, local ministry there, involvement then in, in, in larger uh, events, and then to take this thing worldwide. What was the driving force behind that, and what were some of the uh, activities you were involved with? Well, we don't have an equivalent in the U.S. Uh, really to the activities of the Evangelical Alliance in the U.K. Okay. Because it is a small island of four countries, and therefore you can all be together. So the annual conference would be about 80,000 people for a week. Wow and you really could learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And as part of that alliance, they had a, a relief and development arm called Tear Fund, which is the Evangelical Alliance Relief Fund, yeah. which I was on the board of. I did 14 years at the alliance, and then I retired, because my number two was ready for my job, he'd been waiting for it for five years, and because he's black, um, comes from the Caribbean, and a black leader for the white churches seemed to me absolutely what God was saying and doing. Uh, you know, there's no point saying you're against racism and not actually modeling something different. So I retired so that Bishop Joel would get my job, which he did. Huh. And that left me imminently jobless. Okay. And this phone call came in uh, from the U.S. saying, would I be prepared to come to the nearest equivalent here, which is the National Association of Evangelicals, they had a relief and development arm called World Relief, okay. which was 60 years old. Would I be prepared to come and be its president? Okay. To which the answer is, but I'm British. <laughs> the answer is, we'll forgive you. <laughs> and so, over the... Uh, we'll overlook that. Over the Atlantic 1776 Ocean. 1776 was a long time ago. Absolutely. We've all moved on. <laughs> and it was terrible coming to America. And that has nothing to do with Americans. Um, it's a wonderful place to come to. If you've got to go and serve God overseas, America is not the short straw. Uh, the people were great. The problem was our kids, because we had four. Vicky, the oldest, was just going to India and becoming an HIV AIDS worker. Chris and Gavin were both at school, and the education systems meant they couldn't leave. Susie, on the other hand, was 13. Junior high. Me. Yes. <laughs> that was not a problem. But the boys, Gavin at 17 said, how can a God of love break up a family like ours? Chris was 19 and he said, if that's the kind of God we love and serve, he can get stuck. And the day we left Britain, I preached at the Keswick Convention for the last time, which is the old style Bible teaching conference. Got on a plane with my wife, and the boys left church and left Jesus. Um, nine months later, I was back preaching in Britain, and there right at the back were my boys. And today, Gavin's a preacher. Uh, Chris is a techie for a, a major mission agency in the UK. Gavin puts it like this, I was living off your faith. If you hadn't gone, I'd never have found my own. And the other thing he says is, uh, I never knew what it meant to love Jesus until my dad left me for him. And there has to be something about sacrifice in a Christian faith. That means if you make the commitment, you're actually prepared to make it work. And I came over here with the task of taking a 60-year-old relief and development agency and helping it to work for churches around the world. We ended up, uh, seven and a half years later, with 20,000 staff worldwide, um, working mainly with their own communities, 99.5% working in their own countries. Uh, and really working through HIV AIDS, working through microeconomic development, helping people to help themselves. We were not taking your hand and putting food in it. Because if we did, your hand would be out next week. We were taking the other hand and putting seed in it and teaching you how to grow it. 
And we're finding that so many countries in such desperate need, people could and would help themselves. You know, I, I was, uh, we were mentioning before we uh, talked, I went on Google and, and, and Googled you. And, uh, and I don't know, is Google a verb? Uh, I mean, you can hide, I think it, it's become a verb, but you were Google. Um, and uh, some of the things, some of the involvement that you were involved with, oh, by the way, the uh, World Relief, that was in Wheaton, Illinois? Is that where you moved to, or where did you work out? The headquarters, the head three headquarters. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Tells you something. Okay. And so we closed them all and uh, <laughs> moved it to Baltimore. But um, it had 27 sub offices as well in the okay. U.S. So you were, you, uh, US you, when you first moved here, you were Chicago lived, first. You lived in Chicago. Then first. Baltimore. Then Baltimore, okay. Then I found New England. It was, it was paradise. Um, but some of, the, some of the interesting stories is yeah. I quickly scanned some of the things. You, you had done, you've been involved, well, you've been around the world three times. I know uh, um, Ivan is here. This is actually Ivan's program. He's the executive producer. Ivan is uh, um, originally from... Uh, his family's originally from Haiti, and you had mentioned that you'd been there four or five different times. Uh, I would imagine you've been around the world a number of times. A couple of sort of poignant issues you had. One was you compared uh, uh, your work in the Sudan and some of the things that you saw to something similar to what a World War II uh, member of the Allied forces might have seen uh, liberating Dachau or Auschwitz. Um, you talked a little bit about um, uh, the lady that you met in southern Sudan and, and their plea to you was please leave, please leave. Um, could you talk about some of those experiences? Because I know they've been tough. Southern Sudan is uh, a country with about 11 miles of paved roads. It has no gas and electricity. It has no currency. No currency? No currency. They still deal in chickens and calves. It's one of the fastest growing churches in the world. Is that right? Providing that people can live long enough. And the awful horror of Sudan was to go first in the middle of the major famine in 98 and for people to say, would you go away and tell the world? Nobody knows what's happened to us. Uh, you could feed East Africa from southern Sudan. But we introduced the hand-driven plan. These people don't want handouts. They want help to start a life. At a time when the world was just ignoring them. So we go to the fringes. We go to a Ghana or a Nigeria or a Uganda or a Kenya, which has got roads, electricity, some form of stable government. Mm -hmm. It's got education. You go to a Sudan and the plane comes above you and you worry because the little guy above you in the Antonov bomber in the rear of the plane is going to reach over and get a bomb, pull it out and drop it over the side. And you're going to get bombed. So you're on the ground and the plane comes over and you're concerned about them dropping bombs. We have a nurse from this church in southern Sudan now. She wrote this week to say, please would you pray the weather's changed and the snakes are coming out in such number we don't know what to do. And I could keep you here all day with stories. But I was watching kids die. A mother just lay a child at my feet and said, you've got here too late, can we watch my baby girl die? And we watched a child die and I remember saying to my pilot, because it was charter plane, get me out of here. Now, I took ABC Nightline in and people like that so we could show the world. But on this occasion, I, was, I, I flew about 90 miles to the next door village. And when we were put down, nobody came to see us. And that was amazing because normally the choirs would come to sing to you and greet you and welcome. Nobody came. And uh, I went looking for the tribal leaders. And when I found them, there were 250 people under a spreading tree. Now, in Africa, that means a religious meeting. And I said, what are you doing? They said, we're worshipping Jesus. Have you ever heard of him? I said, yeah, I've heard of Jesus. They said, he's heard of Jesus. You've really heard of Jesus? I said, yeah, I've heard of Jesus. They said, that's, that's amazing. We've heard there's a book. You haven't ever seen it, have you? I said, I've got one in the plane. 
a Bible. They said, he's seen the book. He's seen the book. I said, look, I've come from people who do love Jesus. They want to send seed to you so that next season your kids aren't dying of starvation. They said, we're so grateful. That's wonderful. Could we have the book first? I never baptized by immersion in southern Sudan. I always sprinkle. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nothing to do with theology. But when you're trying to baptize 500 or 1,000 people. In the desert. And it has nothing to do with theology and everything to do with crocodiles. No. <laughs> and it's amazing what you see. It's amazing what you encounter. And to go to other countries like Mozambique, which is the fastest growing church in the world, mm. and to see th Christianity was illegal till 1988, and to see witch doctors standing up one after the other after the other. Were they converted through missionaries? No. Through their own people who'd come to Christ, who'd come to Christ from others of their own people, who'd come to Christ from others of their own people, who'd come to Christ through their own people who'd come and taught them breastfeeding because they'd learned it originally from the Christian doctors who trained them to go and take a message to them. It, it is incredible around the world to see what God can do. I'm a little familiar with Mozambique. Uh, for their national for their national flag, they have uh, an AK-47 uh, on the flag, which kind of you know sets the tone a, a little bit for the country. Um, you mentioned earlier about a brothel. Now, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that. Uh, uh, you know, this is uh, the crowning achievement of the local church when they say they've invested in a brothel. But maybe you could uh, unpack not? that a little bit. Why not? Why? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping that you as a senior pastor will uh, sure. uh, tell us exactly how that all well, worked out. I don't know how many other churches have got a brothel. Um, when New Orleans happened, uh, I urged the church not to give anything. And we gave a nominal gift. Because I knew that for the first eight or nine months, the rebuilding would be roofs that had been blown off and families who needed help but were in relatively good positions. Only after nine months would the mold recede enough for the areas that had been totally devastated to be restored. And then the African-American churches would be asking for help and we could give it. And that's what we did. Joined with our friends at New Hope Baptist in Danbury. Brother Ivan Pitts and my wife Ruth called each other twin brother and sister. And they stand together to try to start to rebuild. That's meeting real desperate need. And that same principle, you can be going down a river in Bangladesh. And a friend of mine who I've tried to encourage and pastor for the last decade, uh, who leads the Christian Service Society in Bangladesh, he's a Bangladeshi. Mark said, there's a brothel. I said, oh, yeah? He said, yeah, most famous brothel in our area. Churches have been longing to get rid of this brothel for years. Government wants to get rid of the brothel. We're, we're nearly ready. And Ruth says, can I see the brothel? And I think, I've been set up. I know what's going on here. They want to get rid of the brothel and they can't afford it. So we're going to be dumped in this brothel to make a difference, which is exactly what happened. We got put off in this brothel, and straight away we met Savannah. Fourteen. Went there when she was nine. Services between ten and twenty men a day. Why did she do it? Because she's got eight brothers and sisters. And they would die if she didn't. Voluntarily, she chose to be the sacrificial lamb of the family. Every three months, she goes home and takes the money with her. She gets a dollar and ten cents a guy. She doesn't get all of that. The pimps get a lot of it, but she gets some. And the whole family is still alive because she's done that for five years. They had 294 girls. They had 196 children of Sunday getting ready to start work in the brothel. We can stop that kind of stuff. And I knew that if I came back to the church and told them we could. How do you do it? A hundred dollar grants.
to the girls, bring them out of the brothel, give them the hundred dollar grant that they have to repay as a grant to start a little business, give them the training to start the business. The churches were right ready to do that. Bangladeshis ready to help Bangladeshis, even though only four in every thousand people are Christian. They were there wanting to do that. The 196 kids, we build a home of blessing where they will be educated and given hope and a future. It's residential education. So they're kept away from the dangers of child prostitution. Cost, cost us about $60,000. It was absolutely wonderful after preaching here to see the women of the church urging their men to go into our fellowship mall at the back and buy a prostitute. Um, in other words, put up the $100 grant for one of the girls to be able to be set free. Right now, we're just waiting for the news that the raid has taken place, that all the girls have been brought out, because 95% wanted to come out. That all the children are out and put in the home of blessing. And now we're already starting to raise support to build homes for them so that they really have a future. I believe that's what the church is meant to be. I don't believe it's meant to be a bunch of people gathered together in glorious, cozy friendship, in trying to while the years away until they get rescued and go to heaven. I believe we're called to change the world, not by talking about it, but by doing it. And uh, I'd buy a brothel any day <laughs> if you could actually get the place raised and, and beaten. You may say, but it'll be back in two weeks. No, no, this is South Asia, not Southeast Asia. The government in Bangladesh will make sure it never goes back. They mm. just didn't have the courage to get rid of it without the church. Wow. And that's what the church should be, the front line. Wow. That is, an, uh, that is a very fascinating story. And, and we're, you'll get updates on that periodically to, oh, yeah. to, to see how that goes. That's incredible. We'll probably find another initiative fairly soon to get you all involved in. Okay. <laughs> I mean, th this stuff... This stuff works. I, I got my passion for it on a garbage tip. On a garbage tip? Yeah. And for those of us who uh, speak more American English, what exactly is a garbage tip? Help me. A tip oh, is exactly. something. Can't even help you that a tip is something you leave at a restaurant for the waitress, right, no, or a tip is um, like a stock tip, like invest okay. in IBM. It's going up. A, gar a garbage tip is uh, what? A garbage tip. A garbage dump. Oh, garbage mm -hmm. dump. Where okay. you discard your trash. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I started at Smoky Mountain in Manila. Uh, 20,000 people lived on the garbage. 20,000 in the foothills. And it spontaneous combustion had taken place. It burned permanently. Mm -hmm. So it automatically took 10 years off the lives of the children who lived there. Mm -hmm. I remember going to one of those in Cambodia. And... Uh, seeing the children playing with the pigs and all the dirt and the excrement, seeing the parents with the single pronged fork trying to separate the plastics and the tin in order to make enough to buy the claw of a chicken so you could extract the tendon, which would wrap it around a stick and it would be enough to eat to survive. Mm -hmm. And I asked where the church was and there wasn't one there. So I said, where's the nearest one? They said, we'll walk you around the dump and it was a long way round but we walked about half a mile as we walked the smoke dispersed the stench grew less the people around me started to be different and I realized the stench hadn't gone nor had the smoke but I was getting into the ground where people had met Jesus and their faces shone and their lives were different and they were starting to have education and hope for the future and that to me is the church. It's the light of the love of Jesus Christ coming into the lives of ordinary people and changing those lives. And it's not you and me doing a good deed to keep a child uh, alive for a feel-good factor. Mm -hmm. But it's actually investing in the hearts and lives of people who then can change their world too. And that was my joy in world relief. And I, I loved having the privilege of um, being part of that. Now some of that you carried over into your work here at Walnut Hill Community Church because you have all these contacts all across the globe. Uh, Lisa, you were going to tell us a little bit about some of the work that members of this church, residents of Danbury, mm -hmm. Bethel, Brookfield, uh, have done. What, what were some of the highlights? Well, one of the things that um, is a real vibrant ministry now is the revived prison ministry where uh -huh. we have 20 women from this church who uh, go to the Danbury FCI 
um, once a month. And we go, we visit with about anywhere from 40 to 60, 70 um, inmates for our visit. Hmm. And we, we pray with them, we sing with them, we, pr um, we have groups with them, we lead a devotional with them. And I tell you, it, it, on the surface, it may seem like we're going there to minister to them. Uh uh. They have taught us so much about what it means to be joyful in the Lord, what it means to be peaceful in all situations. And um, people have, women have given their lives to Christ. When, when we've been with them, and it's been it's been such a joy to do so. Um, so it's not just garbage dumps in Manila, no. or brothels in Bangladesh, right. or no. or uh, uh, work in in the Sudan, but right. there's opportunities right here. We see, Marcy, a lot of people have said, after that kind of life, why come here? Mm -hmm. And. Ruth and I have always said the last 10 years of our lives we wanted to do local church because this is what it's really about. I've had the fun of leading national church and leading an international church agency, but I've always wanted to pastor a local church. That's what I was trained for originally. And I was driving here to speak at a missions banquet on April the 30th, 2004. And as I got near the Connecticut border, God spoke in the car. Uh, now, ho hold on right there. Yeah. Hold on right there. <laughs> sure. For our viewing audience, it's one of those even even for our it. cameraman here today, who actually is the executive producer of uh, Ideas of Work and Beyond, when you say you're driving across Connecticut mm -hmm. and God spoke to you, mm -hmm. how does that work? Is there a burning bush? <laughs> is there uh, something come over the radio? How, how does that work? Well, you know, we all get a bit glib about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I've got one of my staff driving me. Uh, he remembers the intake of breath. He knows that something happened. Mm. And what happened was that God said to me, they're going to offer you the church tonight. Wow. So you better get ready. Now I felt really comfortable with that because I knew I could test it. If God had spoken to me, they were going to offer me the church tonight. If God hadn't, they weren't. And I never ever stayed with the pastor. The one thing I insisted was that I had a hotel, however primitive, because I would be on a plane 20 times a month jet lag was permanent and I would wake at three in the morning and want to dictate or do some work. Okay. You can't do that when you're staying in place. Yeah. And uh, the pastor here had refused. He was an old friend, he'd refused point blank. He's got to stay with me. And my assistant had allowed it and so there I was with the then pastor of this church in his home at 25 to 12 that night. He showed no sign of wanting to go to bed. His wife had gone out. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, I know what he's supposed to be saying, but he's not saying it. And he suddenly said, I don't have the right to say this, but I am thinking of retiring. Would you ever think of coming here and taking the church? Wow. I roared with laughter and didn't know that the then chairman, uh, the now chairman of the elder board, was, uh, had actually been back here at the church saying, I think tonight we've heard our next pastor. Wow. And things came together and we've been here two years and we love. New England, we love the area, and we love what God's doing here. So actually, whereas my heart still goes out to what we've seen elsewhere, man, do I love being here. The people are such fun, being here is such fun, and friends of mine have come, like Graham Kendrick, the musician, and we've had mm -hmm. over 3,000 people in here over the weekend. That was yeah. an amazing weekend. Just catching something different that right. God is doing around the world, and uh, I wouldn't swap this for anything. Well, speaking of here, um, as you drive into the parking lot, which mm -hmm. we did today, there's bulldozers, there's there's asphalt going on, there's a lot mm -hmm. a lot happening here. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. I think it was called the Rehoboth Project. My understanding is over ten million dollars was raised, and I understand yeah, in just that a couple what, a couple days. <laughs> and and not only that, but eight weeks. a portion eight of, weeks. of that, I think eight percent, was was tied to the neediest of the needy worldwide. Ten percent. Tell, tell us, tell us yeah. that story, Lisa. Well, we're busting, we're busting out of the seams in some places. Our kids are uh, not enough classroom space for our kids. Um, some of the big events that we've had in this uh, worship center. Special Can't needs kids. Them. Special needs kids. We have a program here called Special Forces, mm -hmm. which is for kids who are um, handicapped, have special needs. They needed more room, so we decided to uh, bust the walls out, put a new level on the top, expand out the um, the side here for more sp space for adults to more room for the, more room for the community to more come room and for have events. To come in to mm -hmm. have events, 
And um, Clive got this wacky idea that he can raise some money in, what did you first say, 65 days or something? Eight weeks. Yeah, eight weeks. Eight million. Eight million. Eight point eight, eight million, million eight he wanted weeks. to raise. So that was the goal. To that raise was the goal. Eight million. Yeah, he didn't okay. hit that goal. He uh, <laughs> he actually uh, raised ten point one million in it was less than eight weeks, right? Or was it exactly eight weeks? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't. I, I don't mean to Which be, to be a worldly or anything like that, but that's an astounding amount of money, yeah, right. um, you know, to to be raised. And, and but, uh, but if you take the one million, we're going to give away. Mm -hmm. And what will that go to? <coughs> well, that will go into countries and, and churches that are in desperate need. Mm -hmm. And uh, places like Ethiopia would be one country. Mm -hmm. And we will give where the church is at its most opposed and situations are at their hottest. Some countries I wouldn't even name. Mm. Uh, and the kind of country where if you took a Rwanda, $1,600 pays a full-time qualified trained AIDS worker in the church for a year. $1,500. $1,600. $1, and so we can make this money talk. Mm. And when I said to the church, one million, a 10% tithe, we can make that 10 million. One of the elders here said, knowing you and knowing what you do, that's a lie. You'll make it not 10 million, but 30. Wow. And we probably, certainly I would reckon to make it 20 million plus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the church looked at the possibility of giving the equivalent of that kind of money to support the work worldwide that the Lord was doing. They looked at the needs here, the needs of our kids, they looked at the needs of the community. Mm -hmm. And the idea to have more room to welcome in the community here, it was a no-brainer. Yeah, oh, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a phenomenal. You know, I think as I look back, and I look back at your story, uh, again, going back to that storming of the American embassy, this burning desire to have an impact on your world and change the world, and then coming full circle around to having this experience with Christ, having experience with the risen Lord, and realizing that this is authentic. If you're yearning to make a difference in the world, let it, let it begin with you. Let it begin mm -hmm. with not religion, but a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then from there, going into the ministry, seeing this impact all around the world, having contacts all across the globe in some of the most desperately poorest uh, areas. You mentioned uh, your, your children, Vicki, Chris, Gavin, and Susie, uh, all involved in ministry in one way or the other. So you've seen your children go out. I know I had a, a chance to hear uh, Chris talk a little bit about his experience in, in uh, the Sudan and, and uh, Mozambique and South Africa, which is a whole other story. Um, his life was threatened by rebels and so forth. But um, uh, to see that all come for a circle and then come back to the local church and yet still have all these con contacts and the ability to maximize money from the West into some of these uh, developing countries is just uh, very impressive, very impressive. Um, for those of us with faith, you can say you can see the hand of God uh, guiding this whole process along. Um, so. I appreciate very much uh, you taking the time uh, today. This has been a, a, a real pleasure to hear the whole story uh, uh, from Soup Sanat. Again, uh, uh, Lisa uh, Sidlecki, former okay. Danbury News Times journalist. Uh, are any of those uh, articles still available if we were to Google uh, Approaching Sanity? No, nothing I don't think so. Nothing like that? So I'm, I would love to start writing again. You might see that in not too distant future. Okay. Well, for right now, you're website. the communication director here at Walnut Hill Community Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, the right reverend, Dr. Clive Calver, reformed hippie, uh, a friend of Billy Graham, a uh, mover and shaker in, in, uh, in power, the, the, the halls of power. In, uh, in England as well as uh, world, through World Relief around the world and now here in Bethel in the Greater Danbury area uh, having Walnut Hill Community Church. Thank you very much uh, for the time and uh, we, we appreciate it very much. So that concludes the uh, Ideas at Work and Beyond. Um, I want to thank uh, Ivan and Alchemy for uh, putting together this program and uh, allowing us the freedom to uh, explore some of these other uh, interesting uh, institutions in the greater Danbury area. And uh, thanks for joining us, and I hope you'll join us again next week.
week.